Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. We're going to start doing these uh, kind of producer episodes. I'm going to start calling them, be, for in honor of March Madness, I'm going to start calling these the, the mid-major episodes. Not quite at the high major level where we're doing the long form hour to hour and a half interviews, but not at the five to 10 minute low majors just some, some mid-majors now, uh, kind of throwing at you uh, 30, 35-minute episodes, talking about uh, something that's kind of in the news headlines and then contextualizing it, throwing in some history. Uh, so, uh, Benny, my producer, is going to join me today. Thank you for uh, coming on board, Benny. Of course, Scott. Thank you for having me. How are you feeling? Doing all right, doing all right. Sun is finally getting out there, getting warmer up here in Detroit. Yeah, so know. we're going to talk about baseball just uh, Opening kicked day, off this yeah. week. The Detroit Tigers got their first dub of the season um, over on the south side of Chicago. And as the season, uh, as the MLB season is coming out of the shoot, you got a huge uh, gambling scandal that may or may not take down one of the most uh, dynamic, iconic uh, baseball players in, in recent memory, both in Asia and here in Otani. Um, a lot of, a lot more questions and answers at this point. Uh, but I want to just kind of chop it up a little bit. Me and Benny kind of tell you what, what, it, what we know at this point in this $5 million gambling that uh, accusations of theft getting into Otani's bank account, uh, his interpreter, we're going to kind of lay it all out and what the fallout could be, um, if any. And then again, just talk a little bit about history and uh, the baseball and the underworld. Um, I know this was pretty shocking. I mean, when it came out a, a week or two ago that uh, there had been a, a wires that were flagged, uh, money wires that were flagged, million dollar money wires uh, going from Otani's bank account to bank accounts linked to the Colombo crime family. <laughs> um, the New York mafia and a book making ring in Florida, but I think it also has some ties out in California. The guy's name was Eric uh, Boyer. Um, doesn't have any big time record, but he popped up in an investigation uh, by the FBI into the Columbos and their activity down in Florida. This was the guy that a $4.8 million gambling debt was paid to him from Otani's account. It, there was, it, there's been 15 different stories that have been coming out over the last couple of weeks, so it's kind of hard to keep track. Initially, the interpreter came out and said his name is Mizuhara. And I guess Epe his, Mizuhara. Yeah. Right. And it's been... And he's the gentleman on the right, uh, Otani's former translator. Right. Who was fired by the Dodgers last right. week. And this is, from what I understand, this was the guy that was with him every, basically like every minute of every day, almost a, a family member, very close. Um, Otani has a very small circle. He's very guarded. And at first, this was the interpreter saying that the, these were my gambling debts and that Otani paid them off for me. And this wasn't just him saying this. This was the line that was coming from the Otani camp, his representatives, his agents, the LA Dodgers, and Major League Baseball. And this this held for about 48 hours, 72 hours. And then Otani came out and held a press conference saying that was a lie. We were duped. Um I didn't pay his gambling debts. I didn't know anything about his gambling debts. Um, I've never gambled in my life. I've never placed a bet in my life. 
Yeah, here's and a couple he, of he stole a, and he stole 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 the money from me, stole five million dollars from me, and paid the debts without me knowing. Yeah, they're saying four point five million. Four point five, okay. And some of the quotes from Otani is, uh, "I never bet on baseball, any other sports, or never have asked anybody to do so on my behalf, and I've never went through a bookmaker to bet on sports. Up until a couple of days ago, I didn't even know this was happening. So, that's his story. Uh, uh, from the press conference on March twenty fifth. I just, this, this, just nothing adds up." for me in this um granted and i will you know full transparency i am naturally inclined to think there's something shady going on so i kind of come i guess there's a little confirmation bias possibly um but uh i'm not gonna cast uh, dispersions right now at otani but i i just this seems like a house of cards to me like the these stories just um there's how how does the guy get access to his account? Yeah, I don't know. I was talking with Scott beforehand. I was like, maybe because he's the English translator and his bank needs somebody who can communicate with Otani's camp in English. He gave him access, which is sloppy. You never really want to give anybody your personal account number. How does um, o- Furthermore, how does Otani not know that his best friend interpreter has a gambling problem to the degree of racking up four and a half million dollars extreme gambling problem for somebody that was making i read eighty five thousand dollars a year from the uh from the from the baseball team that was it only eighty five thousand ah so there's uh, probably a little bit of greed and jealousy in there but you're you're with this guy every day, and he has no idea that you're gambling to that degree, and he has access to your bank accounts and the story that you, not just the, the the thing that I I think I'm the the, the red flags that are screaming to me was not just that they changed stories, but how the story changed and how all the adults in the room person you know so-called adults in the room the non otani non interpreter people the 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 freaking did i say that did i say the uh, that he played for the dodgers otani yeah uh, i don't think he did yeah played okay, for I, the los angeles dodgers yeah i don't know if i if i just signed a huge yeah. 10 year 700 million dollar contract um this off so, season, correct? Yes. Yeah. So that, and he came over from the Angels. Yeah, biggest contract in MLB history. He's a unicorn um, pitcher, hitter, the likes of we haven't seen since Babe Ruth. Um, and this was coming from the Dodgers, uh, and Otani's entire uh, team, not just his. The, the, the baseball organization he worked for, but his entire business team. So they were all co-signing what the interpreter was saying for a not a long time, a not a long time, but it wasn't like the interpreter said this and then an hour later it's refuted. Well, it let's was like get, everybody was on board with that narrative until Otani's press conference. What was the interpreter's story? The so interpreter's be- story was that. Otani knew about my debt and stepped up and paid and stepped up and paid my debt for me. And the organization sent representatives into the locker room to address this issue with the team as the story was breaking and said that and told the team this, that Otani was just being a good friend and covered his boys debts. And it was nothing nefarious. And then on March 25th, when Otani gets in front of the press, it's yeah. an entirely different story. I was, you know, this guy, I didn't know anything about anything, and I'm out five or 4.5 mil. And I was betrayed by a close friend. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. So the implications are 
quite epic. I mean, if 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 it, there's any evidence even coming close to linking Otani to this gambling debt um, in multiple ways, I think, even if it wasn't his money, if he knew that the interpreter was betting and that he was possibly giving him information, it, it would be the biggest scandal in, in professional sports history, maybe. So here's my theory. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, they were fine with that story because it was the truth that Otani did pay off his gambling bets. But once they realized Otani could be suspended. And ha- and by paying off, the, by admitting you're paying off the by debt, admitting, admitting your knowledge of the debt. By admitting you paid off gambling debts, then the story changed. Because they probably didn't know that he'd be in trouble for it. It's well, my guess. No, but I don't that that I'm not saying that that's not a, a, a kind of a it's a theory. And a, no, but it, and I, I think that's a natural uh, inclination or knee jerk to think that. But when you start to scrape beneath that, if you're the the organization and you're going into the locker room telling your team, oh, don't worry, it was just him covering it, the interpreter's debts. Again, if you like extrapolate from that, that's acknowledging that you knew there were, were gambling issues. I'm saying that you're, 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 it might have been you're almost negligent by the, if you're the organization to go in on record with the team in front of you and saying anything like that, even if it's true. But I okay. So how was that a problem if he just knew about his translator? Because if, if he knew about it, this guy's so close to the to him and the team. He's in the locker room. Do you know how much knowledge oh, you can okay. gain from it. access to the, to the behind the scenes? And and these are uh, uh, point spreads. So in his about in, football and basketball, but in baseball, uh, you know, they're the way the betting's in uh, baseball is very intricate, but if you actually know what you're doing, baseball betting actually gives the better a little bit more of an advantage over uh, the house. Um, so it's it's very delicate uh, and sensitive, the information you could get in a locker room in terms of injuries and pitchers. And... Because he was a former employee of the Dodgers, he wasn't allowed to gamble. Especially on policy. baseball. Or yeah. I, I guess we don't know exactly. Do we know exactly – what sports the bets were being placed on? I do not know. Yeah. So I think uh, some of it I was told was, a, or some of it that I've learned was a, a bets overseas, not in a major American uh, professional sports, but I, 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 I'm obviously everybody wants to know like what exactly were, were the, uh, who, who was he betting on? what sports and what teams, but, and we don't know, I guess it's not public knowledge, I guess, exactly. Uh, the particulars of this right now, well, obviously we'll know soon. I mean, this is, this is uh, ever evolving as I like to say. Um, I read some stories uh, that seem to think that he's, trending towards being in the clear. Uh, I, and these were, from some, these were from some pretty, you know, major outlets. Uh, not super, super mainstream, but, you know, outlets with reputations. And <laughs> I was just like, I hope, I, for his sake, I hope so. But I don't know how you can look at everything right now and just be like, oh, yeah, that all makes sense. Well, the MLB wants to brush this over as right. badly as possible. You know, the biggest star in baseball. And and let's let's also let's address the elephant in the room here. What, what do you think Pete Rose is thinking this whole time? I think he made a statement about it. I'm sure believe. he did. When I think he jumped on uh, uh, social media, Instagram or something right when this was all going on. Um, I, you know, I know uh, I, I shouldn't say firsthand, but really, really 
good secondhand information about the people that uh, Pete Rose was betting with through his MLB career. And they were all mob affiliated, uh, mob, uh, mob book making operations run by made members of the mafia. Uh, I know down in Philadelphia when he was with the Phillies, when in the uh, World Series uh, in 80, he was betting through the Pungitories. I know in Chicago, uh, when he was in since when he was uh, with the Reds, um, Cincinnati doesn't have an organized crime group, so uh, I think Chicago was taking all the book bookmaking action there, and he was betting through uh, a number of crews in Chicago. I know the I think the Basso brothers um, were one of the uh, a big uh, bookmaking tandems that he was placing bets through, but. Um, I'm 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 kind of conflicted on it. On one on one hand, I understand uh, banning him because you're compromising the integrity of the game. He, he was placing bets from the dugout, <laughs> and I just don't believe he wasn't somehow. You know, his whole thing was I would never bet against my team to lose, and I was ultra competitive, and I was betting on myself as the manager. I I don't know if I. Believe but um, well, the question is: If Shohei is found guilty, what's the punishment? Uh, well, in this situation, uh, you're gonna have legal implications. Criminal. Yeah. Well, just for just the fact of just the money, like that's you're you're not placing a bet with MGM and paying MGM 5 million and, and MGM's reporting the, the debt and the payoff of the debt to the government. Like this is, you know, these, this is taxable income. Got it. And you said the bookie is connected with the, uh... the bookie that's, that's, that took the 4.5 million. His name's Eric Bowyer. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. And yes, he's connected to the Colombo crime family uh, and their South Florida crew. So this has, you know, direct links into the mafia in New York and a major, uh, major mob crime family. And uh, it's really serious. I mean, really, really serious. All right, gut reaction. What do you think is going to happen? My gut reaction is by midseason, he'll be suspended. And there'll, there'll be a huge investigation into this. What the result of that investigation, I don't know. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that they, they've got... Unless there are things out there, and it's very possible that there are things behind the scenes that the public doesn't know, and that Otani's people have been able to bring receipts or whatever to prove his some type of firewall between him and um, Mizuhara, and that it was legitimately he was a victim. Then you know this will pass and pass quickly. I have my doubts and I would say that I, in the next couple months, he'll be suspended and they'll, MLB will assign some like the way that that Pete Rose, they there was a whole investigation into him that then led to him being it could have been an investigation that led to him being exonerated. So that's my prediction that there'll be an invest there'll be an MLB internal investigation into this. But just to, you know, for the for the last five, ten minutes, um, talk a little bit about some history. Uh, the Black Sox scandal, 1919, that's the most famous baseball gambling scandal outside of Pete Rose. And good movie, uh, Eight Men Out, if, if anybody uh, wants to see a great movie about the scandal, um, I would recommend it. Charlie Sheen, John Cusack. Um some other really good uh, actors and D.B. Sweeney played uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson. And that was that was a World Series against the Cincinnati Reds, I believe. Uh, that was fixed. 
by Arnold Rothstein, the kind of the first major Jewish gangster of the 20th century in the modern media age. And he mentored Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano, who went on to, to found the modern day American mafia. So that was a that was a pretty big deal. <laughs> they uh they were acquitted at trial though. It should be noted. They were acquitted in a court of law uh in a federal trial, the Black Sox, of um of fixing the World Series, but the Major League Baseball found them guilty and uh kicked all those guys out of all the the conspirators were kicked out of uh MLB banned for life. That's why two of the greatest players of all time, Pete Rose, because of his gambling scandal, and Shoeless Joe Jackson, are not in the Hall of Fame. What's your take on uh, on Pete Rose? Do you think he uh, deserves to be there, especially with all of the um, H, you know, the the steroids, and you can kind of split hairs there. What, what was worse and who deserves to be out? I guess they're all out. I mean, in the steroid era, there were so many people doing it. Um, I don't consider it that much of a sin to the integrity of the game. Like others do. Uh, you still have to be able to hit the baseball. Um, I mean, I think the argument for Barry Bonds is take away the home runs. He's still a Hall of Famer. Yeah. Very, but yeah, exactly. So, and like I said, so many people were doing it during that era. Um, a lot of us will never know the amount, but it's kind of uh, unwritten uh, rumor that uh, many of them were on the juice. Um, oh, I think there were a lot of, and then the, it's, it's also kind of, it's very telling when you see, how the media or the public or even the game itself picks and chooses who who uh, the the stigma sticks to because David Ortiz was found doing uh, ster- steroids or HGH and it it really never stuck to it hasn't really stuck to him at all the way it has yeah. stuck to Barry yeah. Bonds and, and part of that has to do with. Uh, Big Poppy was beloved, and Barry Bonds was quite the lightning rod. Yeah, I just don't consider it the same level of cheating as corking a bat or yeah. resin in the glove, where it's a obvious advantage in the game as opposed to increasing your testosterone to work out harder and be a better athlete. Um, people disagree on with me on that and say I'm a piece of shit, but I, I don't see it as a, the same level of cheating. Um, you still have to be able to hit the baseball. You still have to do those reps in the gym. And, and this is even more splitting hairs, but like we said, bonds, you take away all the home runs. Bonds is still a hall of famer. If you take away all the home runs, is McGuire or Sosa? I was gonna say, yeah. I don't or I don't think they are. I don't know. It's it's yeah. Uh so Black Sox Black Sox scandal. Um, I know that you had some pretty major drug scandals in MLB in the 80s or A single drug scandal that was kind of like a combination of different uh, drug networks and drug cultures in different locker rooms around the country. Um, Eventually there was a trial. Uh, I think it was all in the early eighties with uh, MLB guys. There were some allegations of betting there, Uh, but it was just bait. it kind of reeked of a little bit of a witch hunt in the sense that they were going after more of the, they were trying to focus a spotlight and embarrass and punish the doers more than the dealers. 
because the doers were MLB all-stars and the dealers were no name, literally caterers. The, the guy that was the, I think the caterer for the Phillies and like the Pittsburgh pirates, like the catering teams were the, that would bring the food into the locker rooms after the game, before the game were moving all the blow, like across state lines, different teams, different players. But I know there was a trial and, and a, a lot of these guys had to get on the stand and name names and point fingers. And it, it was all over recreational use. It seemed kind of like a, you're focusing, you know, these, if anything, you should be getting these guys into rehab, um, working on the, the root issues of the drug abuse more than shame, shame, shame. Everyone knows your name. Uh, Keith Hernandez, as I know, was, was kind of the face of that. Ronald Reagan, just say no. Right, right. Drugs uh, aren't cool, kids, you know. Um, if we just, you know, end it here in Detroit, there are, there's been some interesting dovetails between the Detroit Tigers and members of the Motor City Underworld uh, going all the way back to the um, – 20s and 30s with the Purple Gang, um, who are my distant relatives. Uh, Purple Gang was founded and led by the four Bernstein brothers, Abe, Ray, Joe, and Izzy. And they were uh, actually bigger than the Italian mob in Detroit at their height. And the Italian mob and them worked together. Um, Hank Greenberg uh, was a very, very close friend of the Bernstein brothers. And he talks about this. This isn't a secret. He, he writes about it in his biography and his auto his autobiography. And um, he actually used to go up to prison when they were locked up and he'd bring the tigers with him in the, in the, um, uh, on like charity for like charity games. At the prison, at the prison. <laughs> Like he'd bring up all the all these like future Hall of Fame Tigers, and they'd have like a a weekend off or whatever, um, and they'd all drive up to Marquette, or they'd go to Jackson, and they'd play charity softball uh, events against the inmates. <laughs> this is what in the nineteen thirties, forties, forties. This is this is when the, all the Purples were locked up in the forties, as the twentieth century moved along. Uh, you had a, an incident in 1967 in the Detroit Tigers pennant race with star pitcher Denny McLean. Um, it's a pretty infamous uh, altercation, rumor, mythology. Uh, the Tigers won the World Series in 68. Denny McLean won 31 games. Last pitcher to win 30, right? And uh, he, um, in 67, the Tigers lost the pennant to the Red Sox by one game. Um, and Denny McClain missed, I want to say two weeks, which would have been like three or four starts. Back then they were on, you know, short uh, turnarounds. Uh, after he claims that he stubbed his toe over Labor Day, I think it was over Labor Day, some point, some point late in the season, late August, early September. He claims he stubbed his toe, broke his toe, and that's why he had to miss those two or three weeks of the pennant race. The story that I, I've been told by first people that saw it firsthand, people that did it, <laughs> uh, that he got his foot, his toe broken by the Jackalonis for uh, welching on a gambling debt. So you can kind of play the what if game there. Uh, 1967, if he was, you know, you lost by one game, your best pitcher, you lost the pennant by one game, your best pitcher misses you know, two weeks of the pennant race. Maybe the Tigers win two, two World Series, 67 and 68. Um, the famous story is that they were on a, a yacht on the Detroit River and uh, Denny had been not paying his debts and Billy Jackaloni saw him and called him over 
And uh, Danny was from Chicago, and he was a little chubby. And uh, Billy Jack allegedly said to him, I don't know how they do things in Chicago, uh, but in this town, we pay our debts, fat boy. And then either Billy himself or one of Billy's bodyguards like held the guy down and broke his toe. Um, Denny denies that, to, just to be clear. Um, and then I know in the early 70s, uh, Dizzy Dean, who was a, I think he's a Hall of Fame pitcher from the St. Louis Cardinals or St. Louis Browns, uh, he got caught up in a, a bookmaking scandal with, with the Detroit mob. Well, he was retired, but he was uh, booking bets for, uh, I think, former pro athletes, maybe current pro athletes. And then I know in the late 70s, Ron LaFleur, who was a Tigers all-star center fielder, who had had this miraculous rags to riches story where he had been a criminal, locked up in Jackson prison, discovered by the Jackaloni crew, by the way. Uh, there were some Jackaloni crew members uh, at Jackson that saw this guy playing baseball they had a tie into Billy Martin, who at that time was the manager of the Tigers. They literally called him from prison and said, you got to come see this guy. And they went and scouted him and they signed him out of prison. He became an all-star. Um, and they ended up trading him in the end of 1979. And the reason they traded him was that he was spending way too much time with the Jackalonies and the black mob wing of the Jackalonies who had perpetrated what was called the Michigan Democratic Club Massacre in uh, July of 1979, where they cut off three people's heads. And uh, right when that happened, MLB told, uh, according to my sources, MLB told uh, the Tigers they had to get Ron LaFleur out of Detroit. And they, they traded him to the, uh, either the Expos or the White Sox. <laughs> you, you, you know, I was like, you want to talk about uh, ruining your heroes for your for yourself when you start to learn this stuff as a reporter. Yeah, a lot of skeletons in uh, Detroit sports that people don't know about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, we'll see what happens with Otani. Um, but I had a good time here, Benny. Thanks for joining me, buddy. Of course. Um, we'll be, uh, you know, we'll be rolling out some more of these uh, mid-major episodes. Um, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of feeling it. I like it. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, check back uh, very soon for a new uh, long term interview that we're doing. I'm really excited about to share with you guys uh, very soon and more quick hitters. Keep me up to date with everything that's going on in the American underworld for Benny Scott Bernstein. OG pod. Out.